Welcome to the Heart Centered Life Podcast, a podcast that helps you cultivate a life where intellect, emotion, and intuition align. Each week, we bring you tools, resources, or guests to help you find that space where your true happiness resides and encourage you to meet the world's deep hunger from that place. Because we truly believe that when your deep happiness meets the world's deep hunger, miracles happen. I'm your host, Elena Boyd. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Heart Centered Life podcast, where we bring you tools, resources, and guests to help you find a place where your deep happiness resides and inspire you to meet the world's deep hunger from that place. Because one of the things we deeply believe in is that when your deep happiness meets the world's deep hunger, miracles happen. So we are now into the third month of season two for, of the podcast. Season two of The Heart Centered Life has a somewhat different structure from season one in that in the new season, I'm working on publishing the episodes around monthly themes. And if you've been following us since June this year, uh, you would have known that we started with the theme of adventure uh, in June, creativity in July. And you might have downloaded the Adventure and Creativity booklets that have prompts, questions, inspiration, and resources to help you incorporate those themes into your life. If you're new to us, I would like to invite you to visit the earlier episodes in Season 2 and download the Adventure and Creativity booklet to work through these themes, which are chosen to help you come to a more heart-centered space and support heart-centered living. Our theme for this month August is passion and how we find the intrinsic motivation and inspiration to pursue something that makes us more fulfilled alive or uh, gives us that intense enthusiasm for for something or um, that enthusiasm for a particular outcome. When we think about passion, we think about finding that one thing that's infinitely bigger than ourselves that makes us feel truly alive and which inspires us to take action in pursuit. And in many ways, our passion may be thought of um, as our calling because we have to follow it in order to be truly fulfilled. Ignoring or worse, burying our passions only leaves us unhappy, unfulfilled and trapped. So if you haven't already done it, download our passion booklet for the month. The download link is in the show notes below. And work with me on uncovering and reflecting and maybe even taking action on some of the things that really ignite your excitement and interest. Those are probably the things we are passionate about. And as always, I would love to hear what comes up for you from following your passion um, and discussing them um, in the episode at the end of the month. All right, now on to the lineup for this episode. Today, we have with us in the studio someone who left behind a high-paying and comfortable but unfulfilling corporate position to eventually uncover and pursue his passion of protecting one of the most important resources on on our planet, the rainforests, and the devastating effects of deforestation through his company, One Million Acres. He's so passionate about conserving the ecology of the rainforest and making it optimal. And I'm so, so pleased to have him here with us today. So, Danny, welcome to the Heart Centered Life. And thank you for spending some time with us here. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for having me, Alina. It's a pleasure to be here. So let's start the conversation. Um, And, Danny, why don't you begin by telling us uh, your story? What was life like when you decide to create, or sorry, when you decide to quit your corporate job at Verizon? Yeah, so I guess um, I guess I've had you know one of those traditional type of stories where I was living the life of what I thought was fulfillment. You know, I was uh, seeing quite a bit of success in the corporate world. 
I was making the most money that I had made up until that point in my life and my career. Um, was living down in Venice Beach and, you know, just kind of living the life that I assumed was what I had been working towards. And I, I can't quite pinpoint exactly what it was. It wasn't like at the time this calling, I guess, ultimately what it was, began pulling me. Um, it, it wasn't as if I had an understanding of what it was. It was just this feeling of of extreme discomfort and dissatisfaction uh, with where I was at. And, and there was just a lot of confusion around it because I was just like how with, with everything that I have, you know, my savings account, my 401k, my ability to travel when I want, you know, how is it that I'm, I'm not happy? And so it wasn't that I quite knew exactly what I would do at that point. I hadn't quite found my, my passion and commitment to the work that I'm doing now with my organization, OMA, to protect the rainforest. But I did know that this, this feeling inside that I was just not living up to my potential at that point, like I was just kind of a little operating a little bit on autopilot, um, was enough for me to decide, I don't know wh- where I'm going, but I've, I've just got to, I've just got to go. So you talked about that feeling of unfulfillment and just being generally unhappy. Uh, what led you or inspired you to embark on this journey to protect the rainforest from the defore- deforestation? It's quite a huge, um, different from what you were doing um, as a corporate executive. Yeah. Yeah, quite a bit. So I think it was around that time, actually probably shortly after. um, I've always been, I've always had a very deep connection with nature in general. You know, I've always loved the outdoors. I love hiking, camping, traveling. I prefer to be outside than inside. Um, And so it was around that time where I just, I really started getting more into environmentalism as a whole, seeing a lot of these documentaries showing the devastating effects of basically just our modern way of life on the planet uh, led me down a bit of a rabbit hole into really starting to focus on rainforests because I, I've always been very kind of in awe of the content that I've seen around rainforests. You know, as kids, I think that all of us grow up at some point as a child learning about the rainforest. And I, I even remember learning about deforestation as a kid but not really having an understanding of it. I think it was just kind of like, you know, as a child, it's like, oh, the animals are losing their home because we're cutting their trees down. And so now fast forward and I'm seeing all these documentaries and seeing firsthand how devastating this deforestation actually is, not only to the ecosystems, um, including the animals and everything that, 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 that exists there, but on every single person on the planet, how we're all affected um, by what's happening. And so it was around that point where I started getting personally involved just in becoming a monthly donor to some organizations that helped fund conservation. And I just started learning more a little bit about, um, about the topic itself. And, you know, it wasn't like I had immediately left and decided I wanted to be an entrepreneur. Right. I I actually ended up taking another sales job that was honestly it wasn't completely the same, but it was it was similar enough to where it wasn't that big of a uh, a step out. I think maybe I was still you know kind of uh, one, one foot one foot yeah. on the ship, one foot on the island. Yeah, still. it's a huge jump to make. And, um, really. It's a huge jump yeah. to make. And I think that it's maybe a little bit of a misconception too, that a lot of people just kind of, they exactly know they right. go from point A to point B right away. Yeah. So, um, 
Yeah. So I just got personally involved with the, with the cause. I got really inspired by how much impact one person could make just on a personal level. And from there, it was what inspired me to start looking at you know, companies like Tom's who have pioneered exactly, the one for one right. model, the right? Buy, buy a pair of yeah. shoes, donate a pair. Yeah. And, and when I realized that you could protect an entire acre of rainforest for sometimes minute, like dollars, um, that that was kind of the spark that I was like, well, I could create a, a, a social enterprise, a business here where, you know, the, the, the give back could be in whatever it is that people are supporting by purchasing, they could support, they could uh, protect an entire acre of rainforest through that purchase. And that was just mind boggling right. to me. Um, and still is, I mean, that's still <laughs> right. kind of probably the biggest challenge with the, with the businesses is, is explaining to people how that's possible. I, I have a quick question while you're on this uh, topic of social enterprises. Why did you decide to structure your company as a social enterprise and not create a foundation or a nonprofit organization? A nonprofit. Yeah, so that's a really great question and it comes up a lot. You know, from my research and doing quite a bit of it, um, as a nonprofit, there are actually quite a few loopholes or there's a, quite a few, there, there's a lot of red tape that you need to work through. Um, and oftentimes, unless you really know what you're doing and you really have a proper support system in place and other people that can come on board, um, you know, to be as effective as you can with, with a nonprofit um, is, is extremely challenging. There are definitely some out there that do it very right. well, but, um, you know, to, to maximize the amount of impact as a nonprofit is quite challenging as a social enterprise. What I found is that, um, you know, there's just, it's just a lot easier to get to a point where you can scale this entity to a point where the impact you're making is significant. Not only that, but I also realize that there's part of human psychology that plays into this. And yes, people want to help. There's a, people see these issues, they're passionate about these causes and they want to help. And we're very, we're very, I guess, materialistic uh, to a degree by nature. And it, that might not even be the right word, but it's what I'm trying to say is people want to be able to define their, their, their good, right. you know, they want to be able to show, they want to be able to, 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 to have something concrete to represent the good. Of course, there are those few and far between amazing anonymous donors that will right. give, you know, uh, huge amounts of money and don't want to be known. But for the most part, people want to have their identity somewhat de defined by their social good. And so recognizing that that's what started the process of me figuring out, okay, well, how do I create something where we can create a product while at the same time recognizing that, you know, overconsumption is kind of what got us right. into this mess. So the last thing I want to do is do another one of those companies where it's Oh, just buy more stuff, more stuff that will end up in a landfill so we can take a portion of the proceeds and do some good. You know, it really had to make sense to where what the thing is um, would not completely mitigate the fact that the impact that we're making through the give back, um, you know, would not be offset by the fact that we're just selling more, more stuff. I, I love that. You know, there is research in, you know, psychology and I like the way, I like that the fact that you brought up human psychology, you know, there is research in cognitive science and psychology that people value the things that they pay for a lot more than the things that they get for free. And I'm, I'm wondering if yeah. You feel that people who actually pay to get a bracelet feel more like they're invested in uh, protecting the environment than if they just 
you know, took for granted that it's someone else, that nonprofit or, you know, the EPA is the one who's going to be responsible for the gov- uh, for the environment. Do you think that plays a role? I think so. Yeah, I think that, you know, I think one of the biggest things, in my opinion, I, I certainly am feeling it. I feel like m- most people are probably feeling this right now is a feeling of overwhelm when you look out yeah. into the world and how can we how is it possible that we're going to turn the ship around? You know, yeah. I, I don't know. Um, I'm not sure when this podcast is coming out, but you know, we're, when we're speaking right now, June 5th, there's, there's a lot of chaos going on in the world, especially here in the States. And, you know, there, yeah, there's so exactly. much, right. there's so uh, much when you look out. Yeah, yeah. When you look out, it can feel overwhelming. Um, yeah. But I think that yes, to your to your question, I think that when people have something that they can feel tangible in front of them to know that like, you know, I I committed this, I am committed to this. And, you know, even over and beyond the initial donation or the initial protection of the acre, it can also serve as um is a as a daily reminder. And like we are all part of this team that is dedicated to protecting our planet. And that's really what this bracelet stands for as well, over beyond just the initial, you know, impact that it's creating. You know, that that is so powerful um, because when people are invested in the outcome, um, you know, then they put more effort and more care into, you know, the, the, the process that leads to the outcome. So I love, I love what you just said. Um, yeah, and 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 to your point, um, yeah, we are going through so much um, pain and hurt. Uh, when, when we're recording this podcast, um, I'm not the 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 episode will be um, published, um, I believe, in August. Um, so by the time, yeah, okay. by the time you know we have listeners listening on, hopefully, um, you know the. COVID and, um, you know, all that, the, the unrest that's happening right now will be a thing of the past. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's such an interesting thing. I always thought that was so, you know, just time in general. It's such a, I love the thought of the fact that when, when, when your listeners are listening to us speak about this right now, it will be in the future from when we're speaking and who knows what, what the the climate will be. I'm, I'm hoping we'll have resolved some, and, uh, you know, just come out of this with more of an intention to continue to step into yeah. action because that's what's that's what's yeah. really being asked of all of us. Yeah. Point, and I, I, th- think. I think the two major challenges facing um, the United States right now with the virus and, um, you know, calls for reforms of, you know, sy- systemic uh, racism uh, was really due to inaction, right? It's it's the inaction to react. It's the inaction or the 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 lack of response to the COVID situation, you know, or not recognizing that um, there is perpetual, um, you know, institutionalized um, oppression of certain people um, that led to the to the situation they were in today. Yeah, so. Yeah. So. It's- yeah, and that plays that plays directly in actually to what exactly. what it is I'm doing too right. because you know a big part of this project is really the empowering of our indigenous artisan communities, which are really they're facing the same exact yeah. thing, which a lot of people might not realize, but it's there's an extreme parallel to what's happening with the Black Lives Matter yeah. movement in the United yeah. States, um, or at least the the, the heart of it. Uh, what what it's getting at um, with the the plight of the indigenous communities in a lot of these areas in in South America. Yeah, yeah, and um, and and it's really Yep. Uh-oh, hello? <laughs> I was just um, typing that in. Um, you see the chat? 
yeah. Oh, got okay, it. so yeah. um yeah, I was I was just going to say that that I, I completely agree that you know the way the way we conceptualize um you know people who are different as the other, right? Um that that this is us and we belong to this community or society and that's the other you know, it, it gives us, you know, those psychological and cognitive framework to then say, okay, you know, because that's the other, they may be less than, you know, or not as deserving of rights and respect from our group. And and, and we see that play out throughout history. It's not, it's not just this time, right? We see that with the Second World War, right? And we see that with the Rwandan genocide. genocide. So it, it's not it's not a a society specific problem. You know, I think it's more a a human problem. And um, yeah, and I think that highlighting the the plight and the situation of indigenous people. Um, like what you're doing is is really an important uh, conversation to have, and, and and we need to recognize that. I was just affirming what you were saying about the indigenous uh, rights, but let's let's move on to a different um, question about uh, your company. Tell us about OMA and what your company does. Yeah, so. <clears throat> OMA is, uh, so we're a social enterprise. It's uh, OMA. OMA stands for 1 million acres um, with, you know, obviously our our mission is to help fund rainforest conservation with the goal of protecting 1 million acres of endangered rainforest over the course of the next three years. Um, Essentially how it works is we've partnered with indigenous artisan communities in the Ecuadorian Amazon and we've made a bracelet and this bracelet, uh, every bracelet purchase actually funds the protection of an entire acre of rainforest, as well as the planting of a tree through two um, environmental organizations that we support, Rainforest Trust and One Tree Planted. So, you know, like I was saying earlier with the social enterprise, a portion of the proceeds is what supporting the environmental work, the bigger uh, not really bigger, I mean, really just as important of, um, of the impact is creating these sustainable job opportunities for the indigenous communities. So again, you know, kind of going back right. to what I was saying about not wanting to just create a product, you know, there's, there's a lot of businesses out there now, greenwashing is a big thing and, and you see it popping up everywhere where right. everybody's got a cause now. And I've even noticed there's there's companies that are clearly doing um, what's called drop shipping, which is you know it's just selling junk, you know dollar dollar plastic junk that yeah. but there's a cause attached to yeah. it, and you know so there's a lot that people really need to be I think cognizant of online because a lot of stuff looks nice and pretty, um, but at the end of the day, I think that it's really having an awareness on what exactly is the the overall impact model of, of this purchase that I'm making. Right. And so again, with this, you know, our bracelet is entirely, uh, is made entirely of sustainably sourced organic materials from the Amazon. So it's only the bracelet is made from two materials, both that are organic, meaning our bracelet is biodegradable. Um, not only that, but it, we've, um, we have a, a zero waste packaging. So the packaging that it comes on is made from a also a, a, like a compostable seed paper. So you actually take the bracelet off the packaging. You can write a little intention on it. It's got a place where you can write your own little vision or goal or intention. And then, yeah, and it. then you plant it, it and it'll grow a wildflower. So minimizing the waste. Yeah. Oh, wow. Um, and wow. Yeah. And then That's over and neat. beyond, you know, just really, I don't think a lot of people realize the impact that creating sustainable opportunities for these indigenous communities actually has directly on deforestation. 
You know, that's one of the main ways that we can help combat deforestation is by providing economic alternatives to these communities, to the the different practices that you, you wouldn't imagine. You think indigenous tribes, you don't think indigenous tribes are working at oil companies, but you would be you would yeah, be surprised yeah. to learn the amount of, you know, illegal logging and things of that nature that happen. And this is, I want to be clear, this is by no means representative of the indigenous way. It's literally simply that there are, these, these communities have been so marginalized and exploited um, to the degree where there's, they just have no economic alternatives. They have no economic opportunities. And yeah. what's very interesting right now with COVID even, which a lot of people don't realize, you know, that a big thing that was going on in a viral way, COVID, oh, the earth is starting to breathe. The, you know, the, the, the animals are coming back. Right, the, the, right. The, the leaves, the trees are growing again. And the, the sad reality of what's happening in a lot of these areas is that when the when the economy stops and these especially these communities in these in these countries where there there's not as much opportunity uh they have to do what they have to do you know they have to survive and so they yeah. a lot of times they have to depend on resource extraction in a way that um would not have to be there if they had these other alternatives uh to earn a living so i'm actually right. very I'm, right. I'm very inspired by our ability to continue to provide work uh, for these communities, especially during this time. And uh, yeah, that's a that's a, a real that's really a big part of this project. Yeah, and 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 I think what you've just said that's a huge inspiration for the rest of us listening in. Um, so, is the bracelet your most? Is that your proudest? accomplishment with respect to OMA? Yeah. And, you know, I think that it's, it's really important. I think that uh, for, for your listeners, I think that one of the things that for my story that may be able to provide, you know, some inspiration, motivation, whatever, is that this is not something that I just created right out of the gates. I actually, you know, I was on a run this morning and I was just thinking about the date and I realized that tomorrow is going to be the four year official four year anniversary of when I started the company. I know this because that was the date that I got my like you know official incorporation letter or something. So, oh so wow! It's been four wow. years, and when I started the company, it, there was it was a different name. It was a different product. Uh-huh. I was trying to figure out what it was. Um, and even now, as I'm here four years later, I'm still going through some some an evolution process and the bracelet itself is yeah. evolving. And so, yes, I think that the current space that it's at with uh, having partnered with these indigenous artisans to make this bracelet, which is all the, the scope of this part of the project is closer to about a year old. Um, 100% that's the most proud uh, accomplishment I have for this particular business. Uh, and, yeah. um, you know, we'll see where it goes from here. There's still quite a bit of, of work to be done. Yeah. And I, I think that's the very nature of being an entrepreneur. The ideas are ever evolving and it keeps changing and you try to do better. Um, and you try to, you know, accomplish things that mean more, right? So it's, it's, it's always an, an ever evolving um, goal that keeps moving. And I, I think that's, that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. What's your biggest challenge? Uh, for the business? Uh, for the business and personally as an entrepreneur. Well, I would say one of the bi- biggest challenges for this particular project is that, so Ecuadorian culture already as it is, is very laid back. And I love it. It's why I love going there. It's why it's what drew me into, you know, building on this, on this, uh, on this project. So, so right out of the gates, you know, trying to coordinate a 
systematic supply chain, very, you know, organized, rigid system, there's, there's some challenges. Then you take that and you go even another layer deeper into these indigenous communities where it's even more so. It's even more the case that there's that. And so my biggest challenge is not necessarily the operational Mm -hmm. side of things where it's like, how do I get my supply chain to be as efficient as possible and, and make these people figure out how to do it for me? It's more that I have a lot of integrity and I have a lot of respect for these communities and the and the, the this initiative is just as much for them uh, mm-hmm. as it is for the planet. And so my my biggest challenge, kind of I guess right. both operationally and personally within this space, is how do I approach this in a way that I can make sure that that everyone that's involved understands that I want this to be something that can truly benefit them in an amazing way. And also know that in order for us to be able to scale this to a point where we can really do some good in the world, we we do need to put some processes in place. So how do we streamline these? How do we optimize? How do we make the the process of of being efficient with how many artisans do we right. have working? How how are, are we are is each artisan making an entire bracelet themselves? Or are some of them doing uh-huh. the, the beading and then some of them are doing the finishing? You know, how do we how do we optimize all that while while being in a space of love and integrity? Um, so that's been my biggest, I guess you could call it challenge, because I'm still 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 learning how to try to figure it out. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Danny, you are doing so much good work over in Ecuador, um, and it's just not benefiting the indigenous community there, it's also benefiting the rest of us. Um, Because in the long run, uh, the more we protect our rainforest and its complete ecology, um, the better it is for the rest of us, right? There are are statistics that show that... um, What's the percentage? Like like twenty percent of our oxygen comes from the rainforest. Um, yeah, yeah, 20 percent 20, 20% of the Earth's oxygen and fresh mm-hmm. water is produced um, in the rainforest in the Amazon. Uh, there's millions of indigenous people that live there. There are, I think, something like eighty percent of the world's um like terrestrial biodiversity meaning all right. life on mm-hmm. earth not in the water uh 80 is is found in yeah. the rainforest and at the rate of destruction that it's happening uh, you know there's some scientists that have predicted that the la- we could see the last of the rainforest destroyed in just over 100 years so and again maybe that's still not enough for some people to just understand the the direct impact on themselves you know i mean for a lot of people i think that when when you understand that protecting the easiest way to protect the majority of life on earth is to protect the rainforests um obviously the the oceans that's there's a lot of people doing good work with the oceans as well but um but you know when we talk about the climate and you know the rainforests act as carbon sinks and, you know, uh, I think a lot of people understand that rain, these trees are producing oxygen, but what they don't realize also is that they're storing this vast amount of carbon in their root system within the trees. And that when these trees are cut down, yeah. that carbon that was currently being stored is is released back into the, the, into the yeah, atmosphere. So yeah. it works. It's yeah, it's it and, it and it impacts all of us. And if the rainforest, if the Amazon were to reach a tipping point, where there's some scientists that have predicted who knows what at what point that would happen. But um, if it were to reach that and it would there would be an irreversible chain of reaction that would basically desertify the Am- Amazon and it would turn into a desert. And I think that for people to understand, like to put it in perspective, 
if the Amazon rainforest and how biodiverse it is and all the life and oxygen and water and everything that comes out of it were to turn into a desert, how could you not think that the entire planet at some point over a period of time, however long that takes, is going to be affected yeah. uh, in a yeah. major way? We wouldn't be able to sustain So it's all, it's all connected. We're all connected. And I think that's what people really need to start putting more attention on, um, not just, you know, what's in our front and backyard. Yeah, I love it, Danny. Such important work. Um, what, what's your hope for, your, for the future, for your, for your business and for you personally? Well, my hope for the future, you know, I have five-year-old twins and yeah. I have found an immense amount of gratitude and joy through, uh, you know, the silver lining through everything that's been happening with COVID and my ability to spend more time with them and really, you know, live vicariously through their eyes. And my hope is that humanity really takes this time with all of this, this unrest and this unease and this dis-ease that's happening in the world and truly starts to go in individually and every person you know at some with, with at some degree makes a commitment to doing better you know and i think that i really believe that with everybody you know collectively focusing on just becoming better people and being more of an inspiration and motivation for for the people within their immediate circle. We don't each individually have to have a, a plan to change the world. I think that we change the world by changing ourselves. Yeah. My hope is that, you know, we, we learn to come together as a species, as, as, as one race, you know, he's talking all this stuff about race going on in the news right now. There's, there's no race. There's one race. It's the human race. Right. And my, my, my hope is that the human race comes together and really becomes the, you know, the empowered advocates for uh, a just and free and loving world for the entire planet. And that involves, you know, all the animals that we share the planet with, all the people that we share the planet with. Um, you know, we start holding corporations accountable for the destruction that they're doing with no regard. You know, there's a big thing going on with uh, with uh, Chevron with a big oil spill uh, in the Amazon right now, where they're trying to get out of paying millions of dollars in retribution. And yeah. you know, I think that my yeah. hope is that we move into a new world where corporations put impact over profit. Um, and, you know, people come together and realize the power that they have when they come together in a collective to create impact, whether or not the people that we elect in our political landscape are doing that for us or not. Thank you. Thank you, Danny. That's, that's such an important uh, point to make. And I think from there, you know, I think that the one advice I would glean from all that for, for our um, audience is that there is this need for us to get together. And I like the way you say there is no one particular, or there are no different races. There is just one human race. Um, I think that it's such an important uh, thought uh, to leave with the audience. And it, and it collectively, we need to make a difference. Um, I love that. What's, uh, how can the audience yeah. reach you? If they're interested in OMA or if they're interested in the bracelets or if they just want to, and I, uh, I'll let you speak to that, but if, if they do want to get in touch with you, um, if that's okay, and how would they do that? Yeah, so uh, the, the company, so OMA, OMA, OMAearth.com is the website. Uh, so anyone can go to the website, OMA Earth, and see what, uh, what we're up to, as a matter of fact, I have a call with my um, my guy later today. I have a new website that's being it's coming out today, so it's going to be beautiful and really oh, wow. help awesome. illustrate right. our story. <laughs> yeah, I think by the time the podcast comes out, um, if anyone that goes to the website, you'll be able to see the full scope of what it is we're doing. Uh, Oma Earth Great. is kind of all of our handles, so Facebook, Instagram is just at Oma Earth. Um, 
and you can follow along on the journey. If anyone wants to get in touch with me personally, you know, my, uh, my Instagram handle is underscore Danny Oma underscore. I can send you information too, if there's show notes, but, um, yeah, yeah I think you'll put all of this in the show notes. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, I'm becoming more and more active on the social profiles and whatnot. So, uh, people can always reach out to me directly on any of the social media profiles and I'm, I'm, I'm doing everything right now. So I'm running all that stuff as well. Okay. Awesome, Danny. Um, yeah, so all of that will be in the show notes. And so for anyone who's listening in, um, just head down to the show notes and you'll be able to find the um, information that Danny just provided. But uh, I think we are also towards the end of our time here. Um, and I want to say thank you to Danny for spending this. I know your time is so precious and you've got a lot of things on your plate. Um, and we are so grateful uh, for you taking the time out of your, you know, busy schedule to talk to us about your work um, and, and help us see how important it is to, to conserve and protect one of the most important resources on our planet. Yeah, it's my pleasure. I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to share the story and, uh, you know, hopefully inspire some people to take some little steps in making a big piece of the collective action. Thank you, Danny. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you for joining us this week on the Heart Centered Life Podcast. Make sure to visit our website, www.elinaboard.com, where you can subscribe to the show in iTunes, Stitcher, or via RSS, so you'll never miss a show. If you found value in the show, we'd appreciate a rating on iTunes. Or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, that would help us out too. Be sure to check out some of our programs on how to cultivate, create, communicate, and inspire others from a heart-centered space. Tune in next week for our next episode where we will help you find a place of deep happiness so that you can meet the world's deep hunger, and watch miracles unfold.